This is a very personal video for me in a way I didn't necessarily expect. And, and the reason why, simply put, is because I have for a long time been a fan of Giant Bomb. Back in my early adulthood years, I really watched a lot of Giant Bomb content, and on pretty much on like a daily basis. During some of the most stressful portions of my life, I'd always keep Giant Bomb content on in the background. So like when I was cooking, when I was studying, when I was working, it would be there for me. This has been something that I had listened to for years and years, and I was personally invested in it in a way that I did not expect. And to that end, this is not meant to be like a hit piece. I'm not trying to take down Jeff Gerstmann or anyone else. I'm not trying to insinuate that one person's responsible for the fall of Giant Bomb. Instead, I'm just trying to analyze why it is that I love Giant Bomb so much, and then simultaneously why I'm no longer even a subscriber to Giant Bomb. I want you to think back to 2007. That's a long time from now, but just bear with me for a moment. At that time, you were probably aware of the Orange Box, this new game called Mass Effect, and you were enjoying the heyday of Call of Duty, or perhaps you had just gotten yourself a new Wii that Christmas in 2006. 2007 was a big year for video games, and YouTube was at its infancy. You see, YouTube had just started about two years ago and had just been purchased by Google. At that time, video game websites were in full swing, but video game content as it relates to videos really was not that developed. This is precisely the time in which Giant Bomb came into the picture. Now before I get into a blow-by-blow -blow analysis of how Giant Bomb failed, I think it's first important to discuss a little bit about how Giant Bomb started. And bear with me here because candidly speaking, a lot of this is something you could look up on Wikipedia or on a different website. So I'm going to give you a brief summary and if you want to go look it up yourself, go for it. A lot of the details are not really worth getting into, but here's how it started. In 2007, Jeff Gersman wrote a fairly negative review of the game Kane and Lynch Deadman for the website GameSpot. Kane and Lynch Deadman is an ugly, ugly game. Now this caused a little bit of a problem because IDOS, the publisher of that game, had been purchasing a lot of ads for the game on the GameSpot website. So from their perspective, it was a little bit of an unfair thing. They're going, well, what the hell? We're paying you a lot of money to tell people you should go buy this game. And yet your reviewer is saying, don't go buy that game. It's, it's a bad look, right? So needless to say, Gersman got fired. Now, they claimed at the time this was completely unrelated to the Kane and Lynch review. Turns out that wasn't entirely true. The, the truth was, after a non-disparagement agreement was nullified, uh, Jeff Gerson was ultimately able to say, look, it in fact was due to that review and a few other reviews. Another example of such a review being uh, the Sony game Ratchet & Clank Future Tools Destruction, which a similar situation happened. Gerson gave it a bad review, Sony wasn't very pleased about that, and uh, next thing you know, the review got modified, or at least allegedly so, depending on who you believe. This process triggered the so-called GameSpot exodus, where a lot of folks got pissed off and left, a lot of very important game reviewers or those who were involved with GameSpot. Now, some of them went to Giant Bomb. You see, Gersman started Giant Bomb on a shoestring budget, taking along other industry titans like Ryan Davis, Brad Schumacher, and Vinny Caravella. So there are, in my opinion, three reasons why Giant Bomb was such an amazing success beginning in 2007 and kind of running through a good number of years. And the first one is, it had a lot of personality. The Giant Bomb content was not well made, but it had this like poor production quality that gave it a homey, authentic feel. Early videos felt chill in hometown, like somewhere between like a skate video and a, and a home movie. Off-the-cuff quick looks were given with pretty much genuine reactions. You didn't feel as if they were produced reviews. You felt as if these were the genuine opinions. They would be structured in such a manner where you would have one person who knew the game and another guy who was perhaps not as familiar with it, so it was given an opportunity to explain the game, to play through it, and you were sort of invited to make your own conclusions about the quality of the game. But one of the biggest reasons why Giant Bomb was so good was it had such unique characters. I mean, they're people, but they're also like characters in a story. You had Jeff Gersman, who was like this amazing person with this voluminous amounts of knowledge in the games industry. But at the same time, the kind of guy who you felt like, eh, he'd drink 40s in the parking lot of a 7-Eleven. Now you can't mention Giant Bomb without mentioning Ryan Davis. He sticks out as a major figure in Giant Bomb history. Ryan felt like your best friend, the sort of hilarious but chill guy that you'd want to hear ramble about dumb things or do dumb things with. Like Jeff, he was a master of dumb crap, like being cited in the New Yorker on the topic of face and neck stabbing and having allegedly made a Natalie Portman legality countdown website. Then you had Drew Scanlon, the sort of ordinary guy of the group. He seemed more interested in sort of fitness and flying and things like that than he was in video games, and to that end he was a video producer, not necessarily one of their like uh, journalists. 
but he provided this very interesting counterpoint, or at least uh, sort of an ordinary guy role within the group. So that way when he was around, his opinions were just as valid, but perhaps coming from a different perspective. And then you had Dan Riker. Dan Riker is a fascinating individual. He's a one-man tour de force, and he honestly, in my opinion, kept the website alive for way longer than you would expect. Now, I can't even begin to explain all the weird things about Dan, so I'll just give you some highlights. Dan got married to his you know, surprisingly attractive wife in a Taco Bell chapel. He would do dumb shit, like trying to play Super Mario Bros. 3 on a roller coaster along with Jeff. He would do weird 12-year-old man-child crap, like mixing root beer with 12-year-old scotch, which hurts me personally. And he would also get deeply involved in wrestling, and funny enough, he would later end up joining the WWE and leaving Giant Bomb. The second reason I think that Giant Bomb did so well was because it had nothing but credibility. Giant Bomb was created because of a credibility issue. It was created because Jeff Gersman had to leave and, and maintain his integrity as a journalist. And that mentality carried through Giant Bomb the entire time. It started off because of credibility and it kept it. Even if you didn't agree with what they said, by which I mean the opinions given by Jeff Gersman or anyone else on the Giant Bomb cast or in a quick look, you knew that they had the experience to back it up. You knew that they, you could trust them to give you at least a thoughtful opinion. Even when industry folks came in, say for a quick look or for a podcast or during E3, they were not treated with kid gloves. They were treated as ordinary people, and they were sort of sometimes called out for the things that they would do that were incorrect. It was refreshingly honest in a time in which videos from websites like GameSpot were anything but. The third reason I think Giant Bomb did so well was because it was on the cutting edge. Giant Bomb was really good at capturing a market that didn't really even exist then. Around 2007, YouTube and the Let's Play community were in its infancy. Like, there weren't really that many video Let's Plays, and the ones that were out there were, were bad. And the idea of personality-driven video content was new, but it was powerful, it was unique, it felt different. I mean, compare Giant Bomb's early sort of uh, unpolished content that felt genuine to the overly produced corporate, perhaps businessy videos coming out of, of IGN or GameSpot. It was very, very different, and it stuck out. It made people like me pay attention. Now that I've told you about all the reasons why I think Giant Bomb did so well, we might as well rip off the band-aid and talk about why Giant Bomb has failed. If you go to the Giant Bomb website and how it's nothing like it used to be, I mean, it's it's up and they're doing stuff and there's video content, but it just doesn't have that sort of magic it used to. I don't watch it anymore and I don't know many people who do. So what happened? The first thing that I think happened was that there was a loss of personality. So it's the inverse of the first one. The, the Giant Bomb had personality, but in this point, it lost it. Now, one reason for this is the most unfortunate. In 2013, Ryan Davis passed away, and that was a huge loss to the gaming community. It was a huge loss to the internet. It was a huge loss to, I'm sure, his family. And some people say that Giant Bomb died with Ryan Davis. Now, I, I disagree with that. I think that there are many people who do great work on Giant Bomb and, and did great work on Giant Bomb. But, it, you know, it was a big blow to them. He provided a lot of content. He was a big personality, and they lost him. Another, perhaps less sad reason, of course, is that they split their offices in 2014. At some point, mostly to support some of the staff wanting to go over to New York City for family reasons, Giant Bomb split into a separate San Francisco office and a separate New York City office. And a website that had sort of thrived on having interpersonal interactions to having two people sit on a couch physically and talk about a video game, well, they, they couldn't do that as much anymore because now the entire staff was split. It was a very noticeable difference. Even though they were producing more content because there were two offices, the content was beginning to lack in quality a little bit, and this really began to show. The second reason why I think Giant Bomb is failing now is that Giant Bomb lacks credibility. It lacks the credibility it used to, or at least it's lost it somehow. Now, there's two examples of this I want to provide. One of them involves Patrick Klepek, and the other involves Abby Russell. Now, with regard to Patrick Klepek, he is, in many cases, a very legitimate journalist, but he, in many ways, represents a new form of games journalism, something that many of the fans of Giant Bomb just don't like. You gotta remember that Giant Bomb is an older website, and to that end, a lot of its fans are on the older end. They're not younger Zoomers, so to speak. Uh, I've been to a number of different Giant Bomb panels, and most of the people there are in their late 20s, if not early 30s at this point. They're not people who are young, and in many cases, they are people who probably purchased a lot of the old school gaming magazines. They're old school gamers. So Klepek is, in some ways, an anathema to them. He, he represents Gamergate, and in many cases, he's been wrapped up in that. Now, I don't wanna get into Gamergate, it's not worth getting into, but suffice to say, his involvement with that did not make him any fans. At the same time, he's also done some weird stuff that just makes him seem a little bit out of touch. An example of, from this video is from Yakuza Zero, which 
Yakuza 0 is a phenomenal game I'd highly recommend, but you can see here that Klepek covers his eyes because he thinks there will be salacious content on the screen. It just seems a little silly from someone who live streams extremely violent content all the time. It seems like he's trying to appease someone who doesn't even care. It's a little weird, it just shows you kind of the person he is and why some people might not like him. The other example of how Giant Bomb has lost its credibility is Abby Russell. Now, Abby was ostensibly hired into a production role of Giant Bomb later in its life, and the idea was presumably to bring in new blood, but Abby had virtually no experience in the video game industry. In fact, I, to my understanding, she was hired into the role to get experience in the video game industry. And she kind of became a canary in the coal mine for the many issues that Giant Bomb would have in the future. There's no better example of this than her uh, behavior during the Giant Bomb Game of the Year Roundup. Now, the, the Game of the Year Roundup that Giant Bomb does, to give you sort of an, a simple example of what it is, it's essentially a roundup of all the games that came out during the year, uh, what various team members thought of those games, and then in turn, uh, where they might give them in a ranking, or in many cases, what awards they should be given. It's sort of an internal baseball sort of analysis into the various uh, awards they give at the end of the year. During the Game of the Year process, Abby got a lot of flack, and she did because her participation in these debates, which were sort of memorialized in a podcast and a video, were just bad. Uh, the most prominent example that I'm aware of is that she doubled down on the game Dream Daddy Simulator. She thought that should be given a reward over otherwise extremely well-reviewed games like Yakuza 0. And she also said some things that were blatantly incorrect about a very well-reviewed game called Near Automata. Uh, the basic idea is that she just continued to be wrong or at least double down in the wrong way. Her opinions were not coming from a position of experience, they were not coming from a position of deep knowledge of the industry, it was just, well, I like what I like, and it, it came off as very negative. I mean, you can watch this video, you can see everyone in that room, they seem really exhausted with her, which I don't, I don't blame them. Another example, of course, is just the fact that the content she would make really wasn't targeted towards her audience. Again, I've mentioned before that the Giant Bomb audience was, by and large, uh, older game players. They were people with experience in the industry, probably for years, just as, as consumers. Her playing The Sims, it's a little, a little weird. Probably not right for the audience, but whatever. The real issue is, I, and I think, that she got a lot of eggshell treatment. People who criticized Abby Russell on the forums, the Giant Bomb forums specifically, w would be banned. There was no tolerance for any sort of criticism of Abby or her content. People would have very legitimate arguments against what she said, and they would be silenced very quickly. Giant Bomb began to close ranks in a way that just looked bad. The final reason why I think Giant Bomb failed was because it failed to remain on the cutting edge. You know, it just didn't have the novelty that it used to. Now, at the beginning of this discussion, I talked about the idea that, you know, Giant Bomb was the cutting edge. Before them, there really wasn't a lot of personality-driven video game video content. But that kind of changed. I mean, YouTube got big, you had personality showing up, you had Let's Players popping out of the woodwork, everyone was trying Let's Play at one point, and Giant Bomb was just yet another video game content creator. It just, they became one of many. And the good ideas they had, like the Deadly Premonition run you're seeing now, just didn't work. I mean, they didn't keep up with it. They didn't do much with it after doing it once. They tried things, but didn't stick with them. Now, that might have been due to viewer count, but who knows? In other words, all the growing negatives with Giant Bomb, the sort of problems they were facing, weren't really replaced with new positives. They weren't trying new things that were working. It just felt like they were sort of slowly dying. As a result of all the negatives I've just described, it should be probably pretty obvious to you what happened. Giant Bomb's sort of a shambling zombie of its former self. I don't visit the website often, I don't watch their video content anymore. I'm not even subscribed to their YouTube channel anymore. It just isn't relevant anymore. But that's not to say that I'm trying to insult them here. My goal here is not to insult Jeff Gersman. My insult, goal here is not to insinuate that something wrong happened catastrophically. It was just the slow death of a website. And, you know, that's kind of sad because Giant Bomb was an amazing website full of amazingly talented people. And to some degree it still is. It's just not as relevant anymore. And maybe that's just a sign of the times. Maybe it's just because we all grow up, you know? Many of the Giant Bomb team now have, they have families, they have kids, they have other stuff to care about. You can tell that, you know, the latest and greatest in video game content is important to them, and it's something that will probably always be important to them, but they have other stuff in their lives now. They don't necessarily want to be on the cutting edge. And along those lines, I don't need Giant Bomb anymore. You know, I don't need in the background anymore. I'm not stressed out so much that I'm trying to go to sleep while listening to J Quick Looks anymore. It just doesn't happen like that. And more broadly, the internet's changed a lot, you know? Personality-driven content's the norm. TikTok's the thing now, right? We don't need this long-form, quick-look content. Maybe it's just out of style. So I miss it. 
You know, it's, I don't mean to say that this is somehow a problem. I don't mean to insinuate that you should go off and send angry emails to Giant Bomb. It's just a little bit of a retrospective on what I missed and what made Giant Bomb so good. Now, with all that being said, thank you very much for watching this video. As you might be able to tell, this is my very first video. I'll probably try to do more of these in the future, but I would very much appreciate your feedback, both good and bad. I mean, if I said something stupid, I really do want you to tell me. I mean, it might hurt my ego a little bit, but I need to hear it, so please do tell me. And more broadly, I'd appreciate your thoughts on why you thought Giant Bomb succeeded or failed. I mean, this is a big website with many fans. I'm sure many of you were at some point fans, or maybe you knew someone who was, and I'd be very interested in hearing your opinions on the topic. And what made you subscribe or perhaps unsubscribe at some point. And if you like this content, please do share my content. I'd appreciate it. It would make a lot of difference to me. And again, thank you for watching and I will see you next time.